You know why God made things so simple? It's really significant. Why? And I love Albert, Albert Einstein really got it. Albert Einstein, you remember him, was quite intelligent. He made this statement that I really love. All of you should hang it on your, some place in your house. If the solution is simple, God is answering. I love that. And he explained why. You see, if you fully understand something, fully understand something, you can explain it very simply. Because you understand it. And you can make it simple because you understand it. It's simple because I understand it. Where man who looks through a glass darkly, who doesn't have understanding, makes everything complicated. Are you getting it? And you know what's so cool about simple? You can't get lost there. It's a very safe place. It's really a cool place to hang out. Simple is just fun, you know? And I'm realizing that everything about God is simple. And that's why he says, except you become like a little child, simple. You'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. I love that other scripture. It says, even a fool need not err. A fool doesn't need to miss it because it's simple. And you know what's so cool about simple? It just shows you the heart of the Father. He's just so giving. You see, man makes things complicated, so you have to come to him, buy his stuff, he copyrights it, you become a slave and, and dependent on him, where God just wants you to be free. Everything about free, God is free and sets free. It was for liberty Christ came to set us free, so he gives everything to us simple, <coughs> so it's always free, always easy, and no sweat. I love him. He's just the best. <laughs> Huh. But I like to ask you a question. Yes. Uh, the lesson you learned in the garden. How do people apply this lesson in personal growth and spiritual growth? It's all the same. That's what I love about God. He's not complicated. And this is why He says to us, the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen by the things that He's made, so that no one has any excuse not to know God. Remember I showed you with my ginkgo tree, his picture of redemption. <coughs> how when you repent and you put the covering on, how everything comes back. See, all these principles of how we're to live is being demonstrated in nature. And that's why God put us in the garden up front. Are you hearing me? God put man and woman in the garden up front for relationship, to know him. That's the design. You know what's cool about God? He doesn't change. He says, I'm Lord God, I change not. The writer of the Hebrews says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you know what we'll all be doing for the next thousand years on this planet? All of us? Did anybody know? We'll be dead. gardening. We'll be gardening. <laughs> we'll all be gardeners. And I'll give you the word. It's in Micah chapter 4. I think verse 4. And everyone, I love the word, and everyone will be under their own vine and under their own fig tree. You see, God's putting us all back in the garden. It says in Acts chapter 3, He's going to restore everything as it was in the beginning. What you don't get from your human mind is you think God's a learner. He gets better with age. But when He did the Garden of Eden, that was the best, most perfect place for the human race to exist. And He's not changing and He's not improving. He's going back to it because it doesn't get better. I'm just telling you from experience, I never, never, ever heard from God. I never knew He talked. But once I started connecting to the garden, he speaks every day, all day long. I can't help but hear him because it's all over the place. And I'm realizing that this is why the enemy separates us from this. Because you know what, once you experience God, he's attractive. You're drawn to him. And so every question you have in life, every issue you have, will be met in the garden if you, should, if you, if you just go there. I'm just telling you from experience. It's, just, it's huge. It's amazing. I mean, I'll tell you how God shows me things in the garden that... I've been lied to in year in church. Years in church. For example, you were all taught in church that God created the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Everybody tell me. Mm -hmm. God created the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We're all taught that. But if you read the Bible and you listen to the Spirit, you realize God couldn't have created the tree of the knowledge of evil. He couldn't have. Because it doesn't line up with his character. James chapter 1 says, God cannot be tempted with evil neither does he tempt anyone else with evil. Mm. Did you hear me? God cannot be tempted with evil and he doesn't tempt anyone else. Did that just disqualify the tree of the God, good and evil? I think so. That tree was created to tempt man to sin. And James says God doesn't do that. The other reason he didn't create it was because it was mixed. God is totally perfect and he's pure. Right into the church of Laodicea, Jesus says, I'd rather you were cold or hot. Because you're lukewarm, you're mixed. I'm going to spit you, spew you out of my mouth. I can't tolerate mixture. The tree of the knowledge and evil was a mixture. 
good and evil. The other reason he didn't make it was it doesn't show up in the New Jerusalem. And, she, and Acts chapter 3 says he's going to restore everything as it was in the beginning. New Jerusalem coming down from heaven looks just like the Garden of Eden. Water's going through it, the river, and the Tree of Life is there. Just like the Garden of Eden. But the Tree of the Knowledge of the Evil isn't there. Because it wasn't there in the beginning. And you see, Moses is the one who's writing the account he wasn't there, and I'm sure he's getting by revelation. I, my sense was, is God's on a walk one day, and he sees this tree out there, he says, see that tree over there? Don't eat that. It's not good for you. I didn't make that. Are you hearing me? He's watching out for his kids. He's not trying to deprive them. I didn't make that. You know, for years, I'm wrestling in my mind how it got to be because I know Satan can't create. I says, God, how did it get there? Satan can't create. And when genetically modified organisms came on the scene, God took me to, to Ecclesiastes where Solomon says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, there is nothing new under the sun. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a genetically modified organism designed by Satan to take the Godhead from Adam. He couldn't take it from God, so he designed a way to take it from Adam. And he got it. And it wasn't by design. I'm just telling you, it's huge. And you see, I get all this in the garden. I will never get this in church. I've come to the realization God doesn't show up to church. He doesn't go to church. Can I give you the scripture that says God doesn't go to church? The church has taken the scripture out of context and tries to use it for evangelism. It's, it's, I, it's Revelation 3.20. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in with him and suffer with him and with me. That's written to the church. Jesus is writing to the church in Revelation 3. And are you getting what's going on? It's his church. He bought his blood and he's outside. Wanted to, can I come in? And they're saying, no. We have an agenda. We have a program. We're doing our thing. You're not welcome here. I'm being honest. I'm being real. He doesn't show up at church. But if you're paying attention today, he's all over this place. As soon as you drove in, you sense his peace. It's everywhere. Because this is where he lives. This is where he hangs out. This is where he speaks. Because he's at home here. He made this. He didn't make that lousy church. You know what's you know what's really heavy? Do you know where the church is today? Where does the church exist today? The temple of God. Nature. No, it doesn't. It's you. Okay. Be not deceived, it says. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I want you all to hear me, hear me clearly. This is written in First Corinthians, which is the New Testament under the New Covenant. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? New Testament, New Covenant. You know what that next verse says? And God will destroy those who destroy the body. Did you hear me? That's under the New Covenant, New Testament. God takes it real serious where he lives. And when you abuse your body, eat garbage, take doesn't God says he'll destroy you. I, I didn't write that. I'm not making this up. Go read it. I'm just telling you, we've got to wake up to the book, to the revelation from God. He, God's pretty clear about how he, how he operates. And he really looks highly on you. He's chosen to live in you, to reflect himself through you. That's his church. That's his body. You better take care of yourself. Really. Does that help you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil was a corruption? Genetically modified organism. Because so, Satan can't create. Let me tell you about genetically modified organism. Everybody listen to me. A genetically modified organism is not a result of science. It is diabolic. And let me tell you what it is. Genetically modified organisms are uncreating what God created. It's an affront against God. It's a slap in God's face is what it is. Let's be real. We need to pay attention to what's going on. We are living in a spirit realm. And we have an adversary who clearly knows that his time is short. And the Bible says he comes to earth with great wrath because he knows his time is short. Very shortly he's going into, into a thousand years of solitary confinement and to the lake of fire forever. So he's very angry. And if you've been paying attention, he's been very systematically trying to take you out since 1948. What happened in 1948? Two things. Israel became a nation and chemical fertilizers came on the planet. The same year. Satan was at the conversation when Jesus told the disciples, and they asked, when are you coming back? Satan was there, and he was listening. Jesus says, I don't know what the father said, but I'll give you a heads up. When you see Israel become a nation, that generation will not pass away until I return 70 years. In 1948 is when chemical fertilizers came on the planet, and from that day forward, Satan's doing his best to take us out. To take us out by corrupting our food. Pay attention. And he's been very effective. Look what's happening. Everybody's sick. 
They're saying kids, kids today won't live as long as their parents. I'm telling you, he's been really effective because he knows it's over for him. And I'm just telling you, you need to wake up. Jesus is coming back soon. He can't help it. 6,000 years has run out. You know what the last 1,000 years has been? He has to come back. He can't help it. Time's run out. So you, you're all going to see it. I was born in 1949, so I just got into that generation. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be sun. And I know exactly when it's coming back. He says, you don't know the day or hour, but you can know the year and the month. You all look at me like, no way. Let me tell you how simple it is. See, God gave us a Bible with revelation. And it's God's heart to be known. He says in that book that he doesn't do anything without first telling his servants the prophets. He doesn't do anything without telling his prophets. So throughout creation, God's been very clear about how he operates. Every 2,000 years, he did something significant. From Adam to Abraham was 2,000 years. From Abraham to Jesus' first coming was 2,000 years. And from Jesus' first coming to his second coming is 2,000 years. And the last 1,000 years is his millennial reign on the earth, and then time ends and eternity begins. Seven is complete. So, when Jesus came the first time as the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, he fulfilled every single one of the Jewish spring feast. Every single one. He died on Passover. Significant Passover. The Lamb of God who takes away. Remember Passover? They put the blood of the Lamb. Jesus came to be the Lamb of God, so he dies on Passover. That was not a coincidence. Not a, this is intentional. You, you know, he arose on the Feast of first fruits. He's the first fruits of our resurrection. You think that was the coincidence? Fifty days later, on the Feast of Pentecost, he gave the Holy Spirit. You know when he's coming back? He's coming back on the Jewish Fall Feast. You know what the first one is? Feast of Trumpets. Connect the dots. Thessalonians. He's coming back with the sound of a trumpet, with the voice of the archangel. I mean, come on! He didn't make it hard. He's very clear. And none of us are getting it. Like, duh, you can't know. He's coming back in September. I don't know what day, no hour, but he's coming back in September. Feast of Trumpets. He has it's to. The Jubilee Shemitah. Yeah. Okay. And I'll tell you, I have an idea what year. Again, God is significant. Did you hear me? He is significant. He doesn't do things accidental or coincidental. The last year of Jubilee was 1967. And God showed up and miraculously delivered Jerusalem back into the hands of Israel. That, that war was miraculous. Stuff happened that was totally beyond human, human explanation. He showed up as he did in the Old Testament and totally took out the enemies and gave them back Jerusalem. That was 1967. You know what the next year of Jubilee is? 2017. The number seven, I love, God is seven is in all of them because that's his number. And I just have a sense, 2018 is 70 years, eight, 70 years, 1948. I just have a sense he's probably going to show up in the year of Jubilee in 2017 in September because it just fits. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs>